Well, welcome everyone. This is Rick Wycheck, the director of NIEHS, and I want to welcome everyone to the 162nd meeting of the National Advisory Environmental Health Sciences Council. So I will have my virtual gavel, and I have just started the meeting. So I also want to say that pursuant to the government in the Sunshine Act, all aspects of this meeting are open to the public except the review, discussion, and evaluation of grant applications and related information. So with that introduction, Pat, I think I'm turning over the, the uh, virtual platform to you. All right, thank you, Rick. Um, welcome everyone, as, uh, as Rick has said, glad to have you here. Um, we wanna start as we always do by going around the virtual table and uh, in uh, letting the council members and our senior leadership members um, introduce themselves. I will call your uh, name and then I'll ask you to, uh, you know, to say who you are and what your affiliation is. So starting with council members, Jose, can you introduce yourself, please? Good morning, I'm Jose Cordero uh, from the University of Georgia. Thank you, uh, Lynn. Good morning, um, I'm Lynn Goldman and I am Dean at the Milken Institute School of Public Health at the George Washington University. Hi everyone. Thanks. Um, Irva, I think I saw you on, are you with us? Yes, I am. Ah, there you are. <clears throat> Hi, Irva hertz Pichotto, University of California, Davis. I direct the Environmental Health Sciences Center. And Shuk Ho, are you available? Yes, I am. May Hall, University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences. Thank you. Um, Terry? Terry Cavanaugh, University of Washington and director of our EDGE, uh, Edge Center. Terrific. Uh, Katrina? Katrina Korfmacher, I'm the Community Engagement Corps Director at the Environmental Health Sciences Center at the University of Rochester. Thank you. Edith? I'm Edith Parker. I'm Dean of the uh, College of Public Health at the University of Iowa. Marla? Uh, Marla Perez Lugo, Professor of Environmental Sociology at U the University of Puerto Rico, Mayagüez, and now Visiting Professor at McAllister College. Thank you. Um, Trevor? Uh, Trevor Penning from the University of Pennsylvania. I direct our P30 Environmental Health Sciences Call Center. Okay, thank you. Brad? Brad Reset, Washington University School of Medicine. Okay, um, Sue. Dr. Shantz. Hi, Sue Shantz, uh, Beckman Institute for Advanced Science and Technology at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Thank you. Um, Andy Shi. Hi, Andy Shi, Autism Speaks. Thank you. Um, uh, Patrick Sun. Patrick Song. I'm a professor of bi biochemistry and structural biology at the University of Texas Health Science Center, San Antonio. Thank you. Uh, Robin? Uh, Robin Tangway, Oregon State University. Um, Jalon? Good morning. Jalon White Newsome, founder of Empowering a Green Environment and Economy, LLC. Thank you. And Bob? Bob Wright, uh, Chair of Environmental Medicine, Mount Sinai School of Medicine. Terrific, thank you. And now our ex officio members, Bill. Good morning, it's Bill Sabolas. I serve ex officio representing CDC and ATSDR. And um, Suzanne. Uh, Suzanne Fitzpatrick, US Food and Drug Administration. Terrific, thank you. And do we have Andy Geller on? Not yet, okay, terrific, thank you. And now <laughs> um, I would like to uh, the senior leadership to introduce itself. Gwen, are you with us? Morning, Gwen Coleman, Acting Deputy Director, NIEHS. And Daryl? Hi, I'm Daryl Zeldin, Scientific Director, DIR. Thank you. Uh, Brian? Hi, I'm Brian Barrage. I'm the Scientific Director for the Division of the National Toxicology Program. And do we have Jan on? Okay. Um, and then Chris? Long? Was here a minute ago. Jan should be on. I don't know if, if she if she's on, just unmute and you can introduce yourself. Okay. I'm not seeing her on the list, but mm -hmm. I, I did see Chris. Are you there, Chris? I guess he had to step off. Um, anybody from senior leadership? Uh, oh, Gary. I'm sorry. Yes, Dr. Allison. Sorry. 
Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Gary Ellison. I'm acting director of the Division of Extramural Research and Training in IEHS. All right, have I called everyone who's on senior leadership? Did I miss anyone? Terrific. Okay, well, thank you everyone. Um, Rick, I'm going to turn it back over to you for a special introduction. Great. Thanks, Pat. So I would like to introduce Bill Elwood, who is a health science administrator in the Office of Behavioral and Social Sciences Research, OBSSR. So he facilitates NIH's Basic Behavioral and Social Science Opportunity Network. So Bill, are you on the Zoom? Would you yes, like sir. Thanks, Rick. Happy to be with you. Terrific, great to have you with us. Okay, so Pat, do we go around the table and, and if others who are on uh, introduce themselves or do we move on? We move on. Um, you're now up to the, um, the next okay. step here. So I understand that there are some retiring members of council. So I'd like to acknowledge the service of Dr. Jose Cordero, uh, Shuk Mei Ho, uh, Suzanne Schentz, uh, Andy Shi, and Patrick Sung. So thank you all for your dedicated service to the council over the course of the last uh, four years. Uh, <laughs> it seems like yesterday, but we were just welcoming you on council. So because of the transition, of course, uh, your, your certificates will be mailed to you at a later date. So uh, just, I wanna express my appreciation for the time and the effort that you put into helping us on council. So, okay, Pat, back to you. Sorry, just a few housekeeping things here. Um, first, I want to remind everyone that um, we will be having a working lunch today because of the fact that we're spread out coast to coast and um, finding an appropriate lunch period was difficult. What we will do is we'll take a 15 minute break um, in the middle of the, of the meeting today, give you a chance to go grab your sandwich or salad or whatever and bring it back and we will uh, have, like I say, the working lunch. Um, so we will be back uh, within 15 minutes if you um, I would typically at this point be telling you like where the cafeteria is. For me, it's right over here. Uh, the, the restrooms, well, whatever. Um, uh, just a reminder of some of the uh, virtual meeting etiquette. While you're not speaking, uh, please uh, mute your microphone and turn your video off. Try to save bandwidth. Um, if you want to speak, you can raise your hand virtually or literally. Um, or you can put a note in the chat saying um, that you'd like to speak. Um, but if worse comes to worse, if you don't get called on, just go ahead and talk. I would rather that you have be heard than us be too polite. Um, I should let you know that we uh, remind you that this is a public meeting. We're being webcast. And so the public will be hearing us. Members of the public who want to express views regarding anything we're talking about can do so uh, via a, uh, the email that is on our uh, NIEHS webpage. Um, we will have one vote today for a concept that will be conducted electronically via the council book like we did during the closed session. The next step for us is to is consideration of the September 2020 meeting um, council meeting minutes. These meetings, excuse me, these minutes are available on the uh, NAEHS council webpage and council members also have them in the ECB. So hopefully you have time to review them. Uh, at this point, I need a motion to approve the minutes from last council meeting. If I can have a council member uh, make that motion, please. And I can't see you. So, I'll you move. so, so, so moved. moved. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, and I got a second. And got uh, any, a second, any, dis yep. any discussions? No. If not, um, Liz, I believe they can vote on this through the council book. Is that right? I can't see you on the, on the Zoom list, so you'll have to. But oh, there you are. I can't see you all right. And we're just waiting for everyone to vote. And Liz, you'll let me know when the voting is complete. You're muted. OK, so voting is complete. OK, I'll take that as it is. Thank you all. Um, you, the next thing I just want to mention in the uh, information we sent you are the, the future uh, council meetings. Our next one is June 1st uh, and 2nd. At this point, it will not at this point, it will be a virtual meeting. Um, the September council meeting, the 4th and 14th and 15th of September, um, 
a decision hasn't been made about whether that will be virtual or a face-to-face -face meeting. And with that, um, I will finish up the business part of this. And Rick, I guess I will introduce our first, our next, which is the uh, a concept. Um, we have Correct. Shri. Go ahead, Pat. Okay, we have Shri Nadador, uh, who will be speaking now. Um, when we have um, new programs or programs that we're looking to review every five years or so, we have the program officer come to council and present um, and uh, ask for, a, uh, present the concept and we'll ask for your approval at the end. So Shri will make his presentation at the end of that time, I'll call for a vote. So Shri, if you're ready, um, and John, can you uh, get us going? Yeah, um, uh, thanks, Pat. Um, good morning. Um, thank you for the opportunity to share with you this concept to promote uh, fundamental research in support of the Trans NIH Countermeasures Against Chemical Threat Agents Program, which we abbreviate as Counteract Program. Sometimes my Counteract pronunciation will be sounding like a contract. Excuse me, it is a Counteract Program. Um, this concept, uh, did I get the opportunity to move the slides? Sri, we're getting some notes here that they can't see your slides. So okay. Nathan, I can see the slides. I can see them too. I see slides. them. I, I see, see them. them. Okay. Shri, I, I see them too. So I. Um, so David, I'm not sure what's happening on your end. Shri, did you click on the on your slide? Single click twice in a twice. row. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, the concept I'm going to share with you today is a joint effort with the National Eye Institute and National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. Um, Humam Aroz of, from the NIE, NEI and Dave Yen from NIR are available on Zoom if you have any specific questions during the discussion session. Um, Jackie Magic, who recently joined our group from the Intramural Research Program will be supporting this program. In this presentation, I will provide you a high level overview on the efforts of the federal government to address the public health emergency, medical countermeasures, and what's the role NIH plays in this process. And that is exclusively focused on chemical countermeasures chemical threats research program. And I'll provide you what are the current opportunities available for funding through this program. And we'll provide some examples from the existing research efforts within the pulmonary portfolio, share with you some su success stories, and then what are the ongoing efforts within this program supported at the NIEHS. And we'll then provide them what are the gaps and needs we identified and how this opportunity may contribute to address those gaps and needs. And on the end, I will want to share with you information about the couple of upcoming meetings and that may be of interest to all of you. So the events of the September 11, 2001 exposed the vulnerability of the United States to acts of terrorism that could employ unconventional weapons and tactics such as chemical, biological, radiological, or nuclear agents against the civilian population. So to prepare the country to handle such potential high consequence public health emergency scenarios, the Department of um, Health and Human Services formed the Public Health Enterprise Medical, Public Health Emergency Medical Countermeasures Enterprise to coordinate activities across multiple federal agencies such as D Department of Homeland Security, Department of Defense, USDA Veteran of Fives. The this program is led by the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response with the core members of, from the Director of the CDC, Director of NAID, and the Commissioner of Food and Drug Administration serving as core members advising the Assistant Secretary for the Preparedness and Response. The NIHS plays the foundational 
an essential role by supporting the early stage research towards medical countermeasures development as part of this emergency preparedness. Within NIH, the Office of the Biodefense Research and Security located in National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases who oversees this program under the umbrella of Chemical Countermeasures Research Program. There are three major components within the countermeasure, the CCRP program. One is the Counteract Extramural Research in Program with the participation of six different ICs based on the threat agents of interest and the target organ. For example, the ocular toxicity program is run by National Eye Institute. Similarly, the neurological efforts by NINDS and the dermal effect, toxicity by NIAMS. And for the pulmonary research program, NIHS is the lead. The other components of the CCRP are one is an interagency agreement program with the Department of Defense, which supports a vibrant research program at the US Medical Army Research Institute. And also in this program, we have a, a um, contract mechanism to support for advanced development efforts, such as um, synthesis of the target compounds or synthesis of um, are carrying out pharmacokinetics or toxicokinetic studies for the lead candidates identified within this program. In essential, this is a um, collaborative program where NIH plays the role in supporting the fundamental research, whereas and BARDA plays a support in advanced therapeutic developments. So the success of the program is the transition of the lead candidates of, for countermeasures identified through the NIH program to the board down. NIH also plays a critical role in, in this process by facilitating meetings between the NIH grantees with the board down um, scientists. <clears throat> <clears throat> The mission of the Chemical Countermeasures Research Program, or CCRP, is to accelerate development of medical countermeasures and in support of stockpiling these by BARDA for any emergency use. We, it was initially targeted only for a deliberate effort of exposure to toxic chemicals. And in 2005, we also included the any accidental public health emergency situations such as what we faced in the um, granitville chlorine exposure. How the threat agents are identified for this program are from the efforts by the Department of Homeland Security where chemical threats risk assessment pro program identified about 200 chemicals of concern and these are the chemicals that can target cellular respiration, eye, skin, pulmonary, or neurological systems. The research priorities for this program are identification of mechanisms of acute toxicity and identification of potential biomarkers and facilitating screening assays to identify novel or improved candidates for medical countermeasure demonstration of a target or appropriate biological activity for the candidate therapeutics and development use of animal models to demonstrate preliminary proof of principle. Currently, this program is heavily focused on the demonstration of target and then proof of principle studies with the animal models. <clears throat> The CCRP program has an annual budget of about $50 million, which is a congressionally mandated program. And this pie chart shows you the distribution of um, funds across different target agents and different. And in last year alone, for the pulmonary program, we invested about $12 million. So, Currently, the contract research program is supported through the 
funding opportunity for funding opportunity mechanisms that are available one is for this farming research centers of excellence and identification of lead compounds optimization of lead compounds or an ex exploratory research program for example in the exploratory parent r21 program we support the exploration of therapeutic approaches or in the once you have identified a potential lead for um, and through the mechanistic understanding the parent u01 will support initial field relevant delivery proof of principle efficacy for example the program insists on having a therapeutic method that can be applied in the field situation of an emergency for example something like an ap pen that can be applied by intramuscular route and the other mechanism the u01 what we have for the op optimization of lead compounds is this will support iterative structure activity relationship studies or effectiveness or bio um, increase the biological availability or absorption or reduce the toxicity the u54 pro centers of excellence program may have a combination of either identification of a lead compound or optimization of a lead compound the the final goal of all these programs is how the leads identified and optimized in this program can transition to advanced development through bodda the hallmark hallmark of this program is how many leads identified by the nih efforts can lead towards advanced development supported by bodda currently within the pulmonary and ocular portfolio we have about 10 chem toxic agents being studied the ones i marked here with the asterisk are the ones that are common across pulmonary and ocular portfolio for example sulfur mustard acrolein or arsenicals whereas chloropicrin is the only compound currently in the ocular portfolio or the pulmonary portfolio is also dominated with the chlorine bromine phosgene and other gaseous agents <clears throat> so this is a very small set of chemical toxic agents being pursued in this program currently uh, let me share with you some one success story that transition from the nih to the bodda um sulfur mustard or the mustard gas is a basic and and the, it's the most utilized chemical weapon over the last it is in large amounts of um, sulfur mustard is still stockpiled in many countries with an um, unstable leadership and the for the sulfur mustard the in inhalation is the route of exposure though respiratory tract is the primary target we have in eyes and skin are also greatly affected <clears throat> i'm going to share with you what has been accomplished by a, the u54 center funded at the university of denver colorado led by carl white and livia <clears throat> so based on the autopsy of the iran iraq war victims sulfur mustard poisoning demonstrated airway occlusions uh, formed with the fibrin clots the in the death is mostly due to the or these fibrin clots and inability to breathe so clot call wait and um, livium can simulate the similar occlusion of the airways with the fibrin clots in their sulfur mustard and mortality rat model and demonstrated sub fibrin clots both in the major airways and in the dependent airways airways as you see here with the cas scores so they explored whether tissue plasminogen actor activator or tpa which is a potent fibrinolytic agent currently fda approved for intravascular clot lysis in stroke and heart attack as an emergency under emergency use also emergency use authorization so when they explored the by intrathecally administering the tpa to these rats 
they could see a 100% survival of their sulfur mustard exposed rats in 48 hours. This program is now currently in advanced development by evaluating the feather. Similar fibrin clots can be hydrolyzed with the TPA administration in a large animal model in collaboration with Genentech. There are two other compound leads identified within the pulmonary program supported by NIHS have also transitioned to the body. One is with the TRIP4 in channel blocker, it's investigated by Swan George Group at Duke and is currently in advanced development by BARDA support in collaboration with GSK and another all, um, uh, agent for the biofunctional nitric oxide donor agent developed by the radical therapeutics also for the chlorine induced injuries. Over the period, about eight of the leads compound have been transitioned from this program, three for the neuro, one for ocular and the rest for the pulmonary portfolio. <clears throat> I want to share with you the couple of um, studies within this program. Um, I'm sure many of you uh, remember the one of the worst uh, industrial disasters happened in 1984 in Bhopal, India, where a huge quantities of methyl isocyanate was accidentally exposed that led to almost 11,000 mortality, acute mortalities above, and still half a million people suffering from different diseases associated with exposure to methyl isocyanate. Carl White's group, again at the University of Denver Colorado Center, are exploring two hypotheses to find a countermeasure for methyl isocyanate poisoning. When the methyl isocyanate exposure leads to cellular depletion of thiol groups due to carbamylation of thiols, and also they found the inhibition of the thioredoxin reductase. And the another observation they made is a delayed fibrinolysis or elevate due to the elevation of antifibrinolytic agent or a plasminogen activator inhibitor one. So can an anti-accident therapy or a fib promotion of fibrinolysis can be a countermeasure for methyl isocyanate exposure. Is, the graph I'm showing here is after a series of trials with different anti-accident agents, they had some promising results from MESNOM, uh, which is a used currently and in adjuvant cancer therapy, chemotherapy to protect the toxicity from the cyclophosphamide or other chemotherapy agents. You, by administering the MESNA in this methyl isocyanate mortality model, they could see about 40% survival uh, by 24 hours. When they had a combination therapy of both MESNA and the TPA, it, they could improve the survival to about 65%. So this is one of the promising lead candidate that can be explored further through this program or eventually through BARDA support. Another um, observation I want to share with you is um, um, within the program, we support a couple of projects on bromine-induced acute lung injury. Um, the, what I'm going sharing here you, with you is the work from Sadie Madelon's group at University of Alabama, where they observed that bromine and brominated lipids can lead, cause the degradation of the high molecular weight hyaluron. And when the degraded small hyaluron are pro-inflammatory and they can and cause in pulmonary inflammation and lung injury. So is providing a native or high molecular weight hyaluron can rescue these animals. They tried a comp with um, Yerbo, which is a hyaluron uh, solution available for a nebulization marketed in Europe. 
and using the ERBO, they could demonstrate that it can, ERBO can reduce the bromine induced hyper, airway hyper responsiveness, pulmonary inflammation, and also could, they observed about 45% survival in the bromine acute um, mortality model. So this is another promising lead candidate who, that will be pursued further by SADIS group at UAB. I'm listing here some other um, ongoing projects within the portfolio. For example, uh, Sven Zor's group at Duke, who earlier tried with the TREP4 inhibitor, are now exploring a TREP, the third generation TREP A1 inhibitor as a countermeasure for um, chlorine induced um, acute lung injury or BO or bronchiolitis obliterance in the mouse and the pig model. Another center that is um, supported through the NIHS program is the one focused on arsenicals led by Aftar, Atar Ahmed at uh, University of Alabama, where they are looking at the skin, lung, and the kidney toxicity. Is the how the arsenicals are modulate, causing the toxicity through epigenetic modulation that leads to inflammation, tissue damage, and transcriptional regulation. The project in this is also looking both at acute and delayed lung injury from skin exposure to arsenicals and diverse small molecule inhibitors of bromodomain signaling are being explored in this program. Um, another one I want to touch upon is how the delayed effects of the exposure to hydrochloric acid as a model for chlorine exposure being pursued by John Catravas at Old Dominion University where he is exploring the heat shock protein inhibitor, which is currently in trials as an anti-cancer agent, whether that will rescue the heat shock 19 mediated other signals for fibronic signals. <clears throat> so from the, so far what I shared with you, you can easily guess that there are very limited number of chemicals being investigated currently in this program. And also the funding opportunities currently available are more targeted towards translation to BARDA. Or, I mean, more looking at the target, identification of a target and optimization of the target as a potential therapy. So the, these programs also have other restrictions because most of them are um, cooperative agreement mechanisms. So these UO1s are milestone driven and there's a limited opportunity for discovery research. And as I mentioned in the current portfolio has only limited number of chemicals explored and majority of them are known war chemical warfare agents. As I showed earlier, there are about 200 chemicals identified by the chemical threats risk assessment program at Department of Homeland Security. That includes industrial and agricultural chemicals. These chemicals are produced and transported across the country. So there is a potential for any accidental exposures like what happened with chlorine. And there are about 50 of these known, these among the 200 chemicals are pulmonary and ocular toxicants and majority of them are understudied. What we know is about the LD50 or LC50, and we have limited understanding on the pathophysiology of these chemicals. <clears throat> for example, I listed here, sorry for this busy slide. The only reason I wanted to show here is that these are all the chemicals that are in the citra that we don't have much information about their pathophysiological mechanisms. For example, ammonia is produced in, as fertilizers or a cleaning agent, and boron trichloride is produced in used in the pharmaceuticals and in electrical work. Carbofuron, for example, is a um, multi-use pesticide and agrochemical. Ethylene dioxide, ethylene oxide, you know, as an insecticide, as a sterling sterilizing agent, and phosphorus trichloride is 
used as a chemical warfare agents also, but as a pesticides and used in the production of plastics. So what we know about these chemicals is very limited. And <coughs> excuse me. Understanding and guiding fundamental mechanisms of injury for these chemicals is critical if you want to have any lead identification of a target to rescue on exposure to these chemicals. So it, any research on the MCM development for these toxicants in the citra is difficult at this stage. So what we want to do is in this new funding opportunity mechanism to support a development of pathophysiological knowledge base for these understudied chemicals within the citra to support fundamental molecular, cellular, and physiological pathways involved in acute toxicity of these chemicals, proof of principal efforts using combination of in vitro and in vivo models, and support high throughput screening approaches to identify common mechanisms of injury that may lead to some potential shared therapeutic targets, and systemic toxic effects on inhalational exposure, for example, how the delayed and acute and delayed effects in other organs, role of susceptibility and comorbidity factors, and identification of biomarkers of exposure. So what we uh, um, hope is that this kind of um, uh, investigation into gaining understanding on the fundamental mechanisms will serve as a launch pad towards identification of targets. For example, as I showed earlier, the current programs are all more targeted on identification of a target for a countermeasure. So this will come up front as a fundamental research feed into the existing programs. So by gaining fundamental understanding through this mechanism, you may the investigators may be positioned themselves to target a particular mechanism or particular candidate gene as a target for a therapeutic approach as a countermeasure here and then later through advanced development by Barda. And I want to share with you the last couple of the last couple of slides about the uh, upcoming meetings. Um, so they are assessing the current uh, state of the research on acute lung injury and ARDS, irrespective of the origin. And I, we can identify common mechanisms across these. Can those mechanisms and the already existing uh, approaches to treat those ALA and ARDS may be useful for the chemical induced lung injury. So this will open an opportunity for in interacting with the critical care physicians and the toxicologists who are pursuing pulmonary toxicity mechanism for mechanisms for acute lung injury. And we have, we are look excited to host these meetings, hopefully COVID permitting in October at the Rodwell Auditorium. And I hope many of you join in this meeting. And another aspect of the contract program is we host an annual meeting every year. And this year's annual meeting will be hosted by Atap's group at UAB and the meeting will be held on in the month of December, hopefully COVID permitting at New Orleans. And the grant is funded through this new funding opportunity will also be participating in the future annual meetings to share the research. I will stop there here now, and uh, Terry Kavanaugh and Trevor Penning are uh, the reviewers for the concept to lead the discussion. And thank you for your attention. Thank you, Shree. Um, Terry or Trevor, whichever you would like to go first. Yeah, this is Trevor. I'm going to be going first. Um, I think there was a decision between Terry and I that I would go first because uh, I'm most familiar with the uh, Counteract program. Uh, I have been on the external advisory board of the U54 Center at Rutgers, whose focus has been on salt and mustard. And I thank Sri for his uh, uh, nice presentation because uh, 
uh, I think he's identified some gaps that need attention. Uh, it's, very, it's very clear that uh, from the U54 program that there are only a number of these centers of excellence and uh, they're focused on single agents. And although they're doing great work in terms of understanding mechanism, identifying of, of molecular targets and uh, also uh, identifying agents that can uh, be used as countermeasures, they can't do it all. And I think that the program that Sri is presenting provides an opportunity to do a lot more on a broader range of agents. Um, the things I, that do come to mind that perhaps need some attention are as follows. Um, uh, Sri identified uh, 200 chemicals that have been identified by the Chemical Terrorism Risk Assessment and uh, I'd like to know more about how they did that risk assessment to come up with those 200 chemicals. But assuming they've done it right, uh, they then come up with 50 chemicals that, that uh, Sri identified as being uh, potential uh, pulmonary threats. And uh, as you saw in his presentation, uh, we know very little about many of these chemicals. Uh, he indicated that uh, we have the LD50s, but not much else. And I think one thing that actually may not be a component of what he proposes, but does bring to mind, and that is, what is the margin of exposure? What's the margin of safety here? Do we know the no wells and the low wells from animal studies that we can extrapolate uh, safe human exposures? I think that's an important component to consider if we are going to have, be protective of human health. Um, I'd also like to think that if we have 50 chemicals, um, there may, may have to be some thought into price rising, which chemicals we might actually want to think about investing uh, funds into, uh, understanding more about mechanism. The RFA that would probably come out of this ultimately would, could be of two types. It could be an RFA where it's just gonna take the best the best applications, or there could be some prioritization in the RFA of the chemicals of most concern. And I think that perhaps uh, that needs some attention. A broader aspect of this whole program, of course, is the opportunity to expand it into uh, occupational exposures and hazmat workers, as well as the disaster response component of NIHS as well which spoke to the accidents, I think, that Sri was referring to. So knowing that there are uh, 50 chemicals, uh, at least, that we want to uh, focus on, one has to wonder whether $12 million is going to do the job. And so, you know, this could be a tiered program whereby we start off small and then actually develop an uh, uh, increased funding stream for it based on metrics of success. And that brings me to what the metrics of success are going to be. And I think this has to be spelled out in the RFA that might go with this. And uh, I, think, I think they're self-evident, but I think they need to be emphasized. And clearly they would be identification of a new mode of action for a toxicant in terms of its pulmonary pathophysiology. Uh, whether or not a, a, a lead compound has been identified or whether we can repurpose an existing drug to uh, tackle that target and, and whether or not something is ready for transition either to the U mechanism or to BADA. I think those are things that should be, uh, should be considered uh, as we move forward. Uh, I like the concept also that he raised that many of these agents might have a common mechanism of action, meaning that we might be able to have a countermeasure that might actually deal with pulmonary pathophysiology uh, that might be applicable to more than one uh, toxicant exposure. But overall, I'm supportive of this concept. I, I just wonder whether or not some effort has to be put into prioritizing chemicals and how much money we wish to invest in this program. Very important topic. Shri, did you want to respond to those questions or do you want to hear from Terry next? Um, um, I had earlier discussions with both uh, Trini and Trevor on that. I took some of the points and then um, definitely on the 
I mentioned to both Cherry and Shava at that time, uh, it's unfortunate I cannot share what are the chemicals in the list. I use some here as an example, but the investigators who are invest interested may have to contact us. So whether the chemicals they are, would like to explore is a part of the Citra. And we can provide that information. And as um, Trevor mentioned, our goal is um, the, when we write the RFA, we are going to make all those points very clear. The, um, if a center, if a grantee is interested in um, high throughput screening for three or four chemicals, that may lead to identification of a common mechanism or common mode of action or common target for a countermeasure development. So um, all those um, are very nice points. We will definitely consider in that while we're writing the RFA. <clears throat> okay, hi, uh, Terry, you wanna? Sure. Uh, so um, I, I fully agree with the sentiments of Trevor and and uh, uh, agree with uh, uh, the answers that that Sri has given as being uh, important uh, responses. One of the things that I thought would also be important to highlight in the RFA would be um, chemical in silico modeling. If there's a common mechanism, for instance, that's identified across multiple agents, uh, then uh, perhaps uh, in the RFA that that the um, that the institute's open to uh, that kind of approach uh, because I think those kinds of things can also help to accelerate discovery. Uh, of course, you're going to need uh, both in vitro and in vivo uh, verification, but still, I think that uh, the in silico modeling has come a long way, and that can that can add to this. The other thing we identified as potential issue here has to do with. Um, engaging uh, pharmaceutical firms as partners in some of the research and uh, perceived markets and all of those issues. Um, the idea that a lot of this would be, uh, especially subcontracting for, um, for some of the more expensive aspects of the research um, would, would I think allay some of those fears, but still this is a, has been as my understanding is a little bit of an issue um, to engage uh, pharmaceutical partners, especially repurposing some of their um, existing Pharmaceuticals. So they also have a lot of. The industry has a lot of things that uh, you know they've not um, uh, taken all the way through phase three clinical trials, but still might have um, and may have failed in those trials. But still may have a lot of uh, application in emergency situations that could be uh, could be pursued. I agree that the uh, prioritization is a is a is a huge issue, and so obviously it's going to be important in the RFA that. Um, that uh, applicants are encouraged to contact a, a program officer to determine whether or not what they're interested in uh, is, is um, likely to be um, impactful. Uh, one thing also we talked about that is, a, is a potentially an impediment uh, for uh, investigators is the idea that some of these things are likely to be um, to require a security clearance to do work on them. And we, um, you know, again, wonder how that's going to be handled in an RFA uh, because uh, th there could be issues for uh, certain groups to be able to apply for the work if, in fact, uh, they can't get a security clearance. Um, and there's obviously bureaucratic uh, hurdles and hassles associated with that. Finally, uh, extremely important is that the RFA include information on uh, chemical safety plans uh, for laboratories that are working with these agents and um, especially in the context of their university regulations and any federal regulations that come from working with um, select agents. Uh, with regard to that question, um, it depends on the how much amount of the toxic chemicals you are going to hold at, in your laboratory at a time. If it is a smaller amounts, we don't may have to go through all the bureaucratic process of getting the security clearance. But again, it depends on the amount and the type of the compound. Uh, we try to help the grantees to go through that process as much as possible, but it is then mostly handled by the academic institutions. So uh, Sri, uh, this was a concern that Terry and I did have about the biohazard safety, because if the uh, target is pulmonary uh, uh, path pathophysiology or pulmonary damage, then one can imagine that for whole animal studies, this would be an inhalation uh, paradigm. And so I think 
I think I would endorse what Terry said, and that is we do need in the RFA some explicit language about biohazards. Yeah, def definitely. That will be, and also, um, and also, um, may not all the institutions be ready to do an expo inhalation or a nose only, even a nose only expo inhalation exposure of these chemicals. And um, the RFA will be written such a way that if there are any investigator initiated, but maybe would like to use a contract facility to support that kind of an animal exposure studies, but they can do other mechanistic studies on the, in the laboratory, we may have to include that also as part of the RFA. <clears throat> uh, one other thing I had in my notes, which I forgot to mention, was the issue of acute toxicity versus delayed lung injury. Uh, you know, fibrosis, for example, can be uh, a very uh, delayed response to a toxicant exposure. Mm -hmm. So I think we want to indicate in the RFA that we're interested not only in acute toxicity, but delayed injury as well. Yeah, definitely. Uh, um, we, we have a few uh, council members queued up here who want to ask some questions. I think, uh, Dr. Goldman, I believe you were next in line. Well, I wanted to start out with just saying, wow, I think this is a really great program. And it's one of these things that, you know, I just want to go, why didn't I think of that? I mean, you know, that we have for so many years, not just, you know, seen these as potential homeland security threats, but also many of these chemicals uh, regularly expose workers, have exposed communities, have releases, and to not have developed specific agents for their treatment and, and when you look at the progress that's been that's being made already, I'm just so impressed by this program. So there were a couple of things I just wanted to say about that. And one is that, you know, to I, I hope, you know, those of you involved from the um, NIEHS side are making sure that it's very clear when some of these countermeasures may be useful in occupational medicine or in pulmonary medicine and, and could be applicable on many levels, not just in the case of warfare, that, you know, that the information about these countermeasures isn't buried, you know, under, um, you know, in classified systems that people can't access. I mean, and so, you know, I just really want to urge uh, to have that information out in the open where, you know, physicians and public health um, people can, can access it um, anywhere in the world. You know, um, because uh, these releases happen everywhere. The um, the other thing I, I wanted to say is that I think you might be able to get actual support from the chemical industry. The people who make these chemicals, they want to be responsible stewards. They themselves um, have uh, situations where they want to be responsive if they have a train load of one of these things that um, that spills in a community and people are exposed. And I I would not be at all um, cons embarrassed about seeking, you know, their actual financial support. Unlike it's, it's a little different than what you might go to the pharmaceutical industry for. But I mean, they actually could be involved in, in doing research in their own labs. But they, I could see they're being willing to do cooperative research, some kind of public-private around some of it, just to show that they're being responsible um, um, in terms of these agents. And, um, and last but not least, I, I just know, of, of course, that the occupational medicine and pulmonary medicine community will be really excited about this. And I hope that the outreach plans for this program will include at some point in time, you know, doing sessions at their meetings and, um, and, and informing uh, them uh, of some of this. It, it is just so exciting uh, to think about the availability of these treatments. Obviously, I'm all about prevention. But realistically, um, these things happen, and it's it's great uh, to be um, developing these countermeasures. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, we have been trying at the um, American Thoracic Society meeting. There is um, within the environmental health uh, occupational health group. We have a smaller group on a disaster management, and then at all the annual meetings, we are making our efforts to bring the attention of the physicians to this pro physicians and other scientists to this program. So there's a whole group of people yeah. over the years who've been involved in developing the Eagles, um, you know, and they would be very mm -hmm. interested in this as well. Yeah, sure. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Our next question then is from Dr. White Newsom. There we are. 
Stewart. Okay, just a second. Uh oh. Yeah, Dr. Shree, thank you so much. Um, and my question kind of touches on, or question or comment kind of touches on a point that Dr. Penning brought up, more so about the prioritization of agents. And um, I just remember working in several chemical facilities with large amounts of bad stuff, particularly anhydrous ammonia. And um, while that was 15 years ago, my hope is there that there is a more heightened sense of responsibility around the chemical industry. But again, I don't think that plays out all times and all places, particularly in facilities where they're in low income communities and communities of color. And so I'm interested in really understanding, um, as you think about this RFA, are there any, what are some of the criteria of prioritization that you're looking at? Uh, is it who's living around these stockpiles, even some of the smaller amounts of really bad stuff? Um, are there certain folks that continue to be more at risk and exposed either through occupation or again, just the places that they live? And then thinking about some of the accidents that continue to happen, particularly in some of these deep chemical corridors in Houston and, and Louisiana, um, you know, should this be a part of, again, your criteria of prioritization? Um, Again, I'm not sure, you know, if this type of research or those questions have been asked, um, particularly around environmental justice and equity and who's being exposed. But I think if there is an opportunity um, through the work that you're proposing to make that a part of the criteria in some way, um, that would be super useful, not only from an environmental justice standpoint, but an equity standpoint uh, from prevention as well as in response. So um, thanks so much for what you shared and whatever you can share would be great. Thank you. I mean, the, currently the way the program has been designed is to focus on the therapy, promoting the development of countermeasures so that we are in a more, in at least a preparedness mode. And uh, the, the priority chemicals are uh, annually assessed by in consultation with the Department of Homeland Security and also with BARDA. BARDA will come with a list of chemicals that have been indicated to them as priority chemicals for which the countermeasures need to be on the pipeline at least. So we work with both the agencies in um, prioritizing those. And definitely once the, this program evolves a little bit more, I will be glad to in, have interactions with uh, within our um, uh, community outreach program at NIHS and with the environmental justice to see how this information can be disseminated to those communities for sure. Thank you for that. Thank you. And, and Dr. Wright, I will give you the next to last question. Uh, it's a great presentation, a very interesting program. So I, I wanted to provide a clinical perspective. I'm actually a pediatric ER physician and I did a medical toxicology fellowship. So your presentation brought back some fond memories from 25 years ago when I was training. It's pretty much the same agents. But um, having said that, it, it seems like one of the big research gaps is actually in diagnostics. Um, very few physicians would recognize mustard gas poisoning. Very few physicians would know what chlorine does or what bromine does and how to treat it. And I think there should be some research, I would argue, in that area. You know, there may be diagnostic tests, maybe using untargeted methods, but also ambient sensors could be used. A lot of these agents stick to the clothes, and there's actually been cases that people working in the emergency room have been had, had secondary poisons. And also, I think that would address Joanne's question to some extent, because if these are in uh, waste sites, you know, ambient sensors could help to alert whether or not, you know, they're being released. So I, I, I would really urge the program to think about diagnostics as well. I know uh, it's too late for this particular RFA. The, through the DOD program, we have an efforts going on for a sense of development for assessing the exposure levels and also some of the biomarkers. Some of the biomarkers developed through our program also, for example, chlorinated lipids um, that can stay in your system for longer periods as one of the markers for exposure to chlorine. Uh, it's in developed by uh, Rakesh Patel and others at the UAB, and it's still in the developmental stages. Some, that is something promising as a measure of exposure. On, as a biomarker of exposure. And 
we definitely we have this interaction with all the agencies but um, we have to do a lot more on the diagnostics as, as you suggested and we'll definitely take that into consideration thank you okay thank you um, and our last question is from dr geller uh, thank you uh, thank you pat and thank you Shree, for that presentation. I just wanted to check or offer um, potential interaction with the Environmental Protection Agency. We've got a Homeland Security Research Program, and I'm sure you know our, our responsibilities for, for cleaning up and remediating um, for bio, rad, uh, chemical, um, uh, and, and nuclear materials. Um, we do look at contaminant characterization and consequence assessment. So in terms of of identifying those situations and the situations that we've put together and actually the simulations that our Homeland Security Research Program um, runs um, may be really very, very fertile ground for thinking about the, the, uh, the medical and biomedical responses that you're thinking of. We really think mostly in terms of our physical responses like, and, and, and cleanup yeah. responses. Um, working and, and drawing in these biomedical approaches would be, a, I, I think, a great, uh, a great opportunity. So thank you and we'd look forward to working with you. Yeah, sure, definitely. I'll be in touch with you, Andy. And sure, you have a question from Dr. Uh, from Shoot My Ho in the, oh, and it just went away. Um, about open, where did it go? Will open pit burning exposure be included? If you can give us a quick answer to that, then we can kind of move on to our vote. Um, I may not be in this program because this is more focused on the chemicals identified through the um, CITRA. Okay, um, I'm looking at the, uh, I, I'm gonna, in the interest of time, I'm gonna go ahead and move us to a vote. I would suggest that people look on the uh, the chat, especially Dr. Young has, has provided some explanation about the uh, uh, some of the toxicity availability and such. And so um, at this point, I want to thank um, Drs. Kavanaugh and Penny, and I will ask for a, and, and tell people if they have more questions, they can contact Sheree directly or put them in the chat and Sheree can respond that way. I'm gonna ask for a motion to um, approve this concept to go forward. I've got a motion, do I have a second? Uh, they've got a second. Any discussion, further discussion or debate? If not, I will ask you to um, go into your electronic council book and vote uh, for this concept. And Liz, you will let me know when we have achieved our goal. Okay. okay, looks like we're there, and I assume that that was approved. Is. We have our voting approval. Okay, congratulations, Sri. Thank you very much, and thank you all for a um, for a very nice discussion there. Again, I recommend that people go into the chat uh, and and look. We have a question from Doctor Tangway too that uh, Sri, you may want to address that question yeah, I will. as well. I will look into the thank chat you. box and take it up there. Thank you, sir. Um, sure. We're now um, scheduled for a quick 15 minute grab your lunch and come back break. Um, why don't we try to get back here at 12.05, give us our full 15 minutes, at which time Dr. Wojciech will, will give his, um, his report of the director, followed by um, some interesting, um, an interesting presentation from our division of, of uh, National Tax College Program. Um, Dr. Wojciech, did you want to say anything before we take our break? No, I uh, just thank everyone for the morning session. And so let's get back here in 15 minutes.